people think people are rebelling against old ways of working. And I suggest to you that the problems have always been there. We've just not acknowledged them and accommodated the needs of the people to live fulfilling lives as well as having fulfilling careers. Welcome to You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. You are ambitious in life and in your career, but something is missing. You want to bring more of your passion to what you do, because let's be honest, you pour a ton into your work and it needs to mean more. I'm your host, Laura Eigel. I'm a mom, wife, PhD, coach, advocate, introvert, and indoor rowing fanatic. I'm passionate about living a life that's in line with my values. We'll give you the actionable tips and tools you need to lead with your values, make a difference, and have career success. The world needs more diversity and authenticity in the top jobs at organizations. Your leadership belongs there. You belong in the C-suite. What gets you up in the morning? What drives your decisions? What do you stand for? No idea, not even sure where to start? I use my values to guide my life and career. It's the basis of how I've built boundaries for myself and stuck to them. Are you ready to dig into what matters to you? Go to thecatchgroup.com to download your free values worksheet. That's thecatchgroup.com to download your free values worksheet to get to your core values and take action on what matters most. Welcome to this week's episode of the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. I'm excited to introduce this week's guest, Deb Caviello. Deb is an advisor, author, podcast host, and founder of Illumination Partners, a consulting firm for CEOs navigating change. A trusted partner to C-Suite leaders, Deb brings over 25 years of experience in strategy and quality and operational excellence roles combined with her 20 years in the flavors and fragrance industry to support her clients as they work together to identify, assess, and solve the issues that are preventing their business growth. Certified as Lean and Six Sigma Black Belt in process improvement, she has developed powerful programs devoted to helping CEOs identify emerging leaders, understand that people are your greatest tool in your toolbox, She's also a member of Women in Flavor and Fragrance Commerce and an avid curler with the Cincinnati Curling Club and a mother of three residing in Cincinnati, Ohio with her husband, Dan, of 32 years. We talked about why she was mislabeled as an introvert, unable to share her creativity, her background in operational excellence and utilizing her background in STEM to work with C-suite leaders within their team dynamics. We also talked about a pivotal meeting that changed her outlook on her own leadership and the downfall of only seeking results versus long game outcomes in her new book, The CEO's Compass. Let's get started. Well, welcome to the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. I'm really excited to have you, Deb. All right, Laura, I am excited as well. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation and share our insights and the opportunities we have to really make a difference. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And I just cannot wait to dig into our conversation. But before we do, can you tell us your story? Oh, there are so many stories to share, but if I could distill it down, I am a creative and a problem solver. You know, from a very young age, family could not keep me quiet. I wanted to talk. I wanted to express anything and everything that was on my mind. I wanted to share to the point where even my teachers in school told my parents, can you keep Deb quiet? So it's one of those things that's been a strength that has come out over the years. Uh, Sometimes society didn't appreciate me being outspoken and asking why. And why being the indicator of a problem solver, somebody that was curious and wanted to understand why things work the way they did. I remember even in high school math, if I didn't understand how to solve a problem, I would say, why, why? And then even the students would say, Deb, can you be quiet? Can you ask the teacher offline? And it was one of those things, if nothing else, it was very frustrating. And when people started labeling me as an introvert, 
because I went quiet. I actually would say it's, I'm a mislabeled introvert. I'm actually an extrovert, but society didn't appreciate that creativity of wanting to understand the world, make a difference, create things, and also solve problems, which led me into the area in my education where I went into engineering. I had a curiosity for how to fix things. My, my upbringing, and I'm sure we all have these things happen, was a little bit chaotic. And as a child, you don't understand the world, but you also try to say, well, what can I do to make things stable and safe, et cetera? And I think being a creative, asking why, being very outspoken, having my own thoughts, and then seeking to solve problems married with my engineering brought me into corporate, where I eventually settled in the area of quality and operational excellence. How can we make things better, faster, cheaper, and safer, which brought me through my career, where I eventually wound up as the vice president of quality and the vice president of operational excellence for a multinational flavor and fragrance company. And while I've been in so many industries from electronics to data comp to um, the chemical industry, I can be in very many different areas because it's that problem solving, that ability to communicate and be able to now see and listen and see the talents of the people. I eventually then evolved a lot of insights about what does it take to be successful as a sweet, sweet leader or an aspiring one. Because so many of us develop our technical skills, we have our stories, and then sometimes we get stuck. And it's because I've seen both myself and others get stuck, I realize the greatest gift that I can do is help evolve the leadership insights to get people to fulfill their greatest potential. And so that's a long story trying to distill it into three to five minutes, but that's a little bit who I am, a creative problem solver that wants to elevate businesses and the capability of people. I love that so much. And I, I really resonated with this idea of you being mislabeled as an introvert. That's really interesting that basically you, you listen to people and you said, okay, well, you don't want to hear me ask why, so I'm just not going to ask. And there's so many things you can learn from that. If you've personally felt that, that is a place where we start losing our confidence because what we say or how we said it may not have mattered or met with dissension. And really, we need to celebrate those people to simply have the courage to express their thoughts. And maybe simply we need to evolve how we communicate our message for better influence. Or sometimes we need to decide if we're in the right environment that appreciates what we have to say. Those are really, really hard for leaders that are high performers to come to that realization. And if they don't take that time, they lose their confidence and they shrink. And they le are left wondering, what could I have been? Oh, that's so powerful. And I am a, an extrovert. I'm sorry, I am an introvert, I'm not an extrovert. Um, I am an introvert. And sometimes it's really the power of the question, right? That's my, that's my superpower is saying, I might not know the answer right now because I need to process it, but I do have a question for you. <laughs> so I understand this need of, the why behind something, just to understand how does that work? How can we make it better? And so that's really an interesting thing. And you know what, uh, being that I think differently, I don't like being put in a box. I don't mm -hmm. like being profiled. I think we need to transcend those different superpowers of being an introvert, as well as being an extrovert. And I think we can be both. An introvert has the power and wisdom of being able to listen to the chaos. What's the problem in front of us? Why are people arguing? Why has somebody, why are teams not uh, connecting really well? And we have the wisdom and patience to step back and listen to all of the data and information. And then, as you say, process, which we label as the introvert, but it's the superpower of being able to come forth and reframe what we heard into something that level sets and resonates with everybody. And then you become passionate powerful because you had the courage to come forward and say, this is what I think the problem is. Does everybody agree? And then immediately you are wise. You've moved the team from being in a place of chaos to maybe being able to move forward. So asking questions and listening is actually what leaders need to do. And sometimes the extroverts miss this. Mm, so interesting. And so you talked a bit about, you know, your extensive background as an engineer and in STEM and and trying to figure out the why you're a problem solver. And I love that you've now transitioned that into, you know, now in teams. 
Can you tell me a little bit more, a little bit deeper on how you transition that skill in engineering to now working in, in insights and uncovering those in terms of team dynamics and C-suite leaders? So you can't take the STEM professional out of me. I am always going to be problem solving. I still do that when C-suite leaders are attracted to the work that I'm doing. They are usually at a place of crisis or chaos, or if not, they're at a place pre-chaos because something in their environment is changing. So I am usually brought in for my technical expertise. Hey, Deb, we don't have a good foundation in root cause analysis. We keep fixing the same problems over and over again. Can you teach us the basic skills? and build that capability. Or Deb, can you bring us in? Our customers now require us to have this quality certification. Help us. We don't even know where to start. That's where my technical skills come in. And I will partner with the leaders to do that with them because I can certainly do the work, but then I also try to elevate the people and teach them how. So they don't need me anymore. And that is the drop-in CEO brand. But what I have learned in addition to using my technical skills, and I learned this in my last role, was my region in operations was not performing well. And I had been the leader that I'm not today, the firefighter, the person that went in to try to do the problem solving. And not only was I burning myself out, I was burning the team. And I realized that I needed to do some personal work and discover who was I as a leader why do I lead and how was I going to lead differently? And I realized I had smart people around me and my role was to understand their strength and elevate them. And if they had any barriers to perform, whether it was in confidence or articulating messages, I had skills in that. And my role was to remove those barriers and help them have be confident communicators and influential people that ultimately elevated the performance of my region from being in last place number four, to second place in about 18 months, because I did the greater work of elevating the performance of the people in the organization. And that's a lot about the book that I wrote, The CEO's Compass. It's not necessarily what we do, but how we do it. And what was your motivation to get that around that self-awareness to action? Was it going from four to two? Was it, what was it that change that you realized, hey, this isn't working and I, and, and I need to change and it's me? Thank you, Lori, is a really, really great question. It was a dark time for me. It was about a year or so into the role for which I didn't feel very good and everybody was running ragged. And so I tell the story about we needed to go to a global meeting for which each of the regional leaders had to communicate what they were going to do in the following year. And I had done that and didn't get the results. So I went to that meeting in Europe. I took a day or two to reflect on, you know what? Let's not focus on what I was doing, but who was I? What were my core values as a leader that I knew were important to ground me in decision making? And how was I going to lead differently? Not necessarily leading the teams, but helping my leaders to lead those teams. And when I did my presentation and started from a place of saying, I want to be able to enable the people that work for me to spend more time at home or in their community or with their families doing the things they want to do versus working so many hours. I want to be able to make our lives simpler and easy, faster, cheaper. That's what I was going to do differently. And then only at the end, I talked about, here's what we're going to do, A to Z. And the leaders didn't like what I said. They said, you didn't spend enough time talking about the details of what you're going to do in the next year, like everybody else did. And so I was devastated. And when I went to lunch and I was joined by some of my colleagues, they came over and said, Deb, we love what you said. We need more leaders to think differently, think about their leadership style to get a different result. Because if we keep hiring the same kind of leaders, you're going to get the same results oriented leaders versus those that seek a higher outcome and peace of mind. And so I went with my gut and that affirmation and says, I am going to lead differently. I'm going to lead towards helping people have more productive lives, not spend so much time working, elevating their capability and making their jobs easier. And that's how we got to number two. And that's the impact that I leave. So that is the realization of being in a dark place and ultimately getting a team to perform to a higher potential. 
I love that story so much for so many reasons. I told um, you I've got a lot of stories here. I mean, we could go on and on, but I mean, I, I think we have to go through those moments in our life. You, you can't avoid them, but it's that strength and wisdom after reflecting a little bit to say, I got to do something different. And I continue to evolve and figure out what do I need to do differently. Yeah. And I love that it was the feedback from your peers really that stuck with you because we get feedback all the time from lots of people who think that that they know the right thing to do. Um, but I love that you kept with your conviction of leading with your values and leading, leading your people to, to get the obstacles out of their way, like a servant leader. Yeah. And you know, it's also about the legacy you leave. So yes, I can check the box and we got the result, but every one of those leaders are now performing at a higher level or have been promoted into higher roles. And yes, they were already high performers. One could say they naturally would have, or maybe not because each one of them had a lot of value. They were running in a hamster wheel. They at points were losing their confidence and now they've moved to other companies, higher level positions. I feel like I had a small part in them realizing their higher potential. I love that. And it, um, I was going to ask you this next question, kind of some of these bigger issues that you see leaders struggling with in this. Um, and I saw it when I was in corporate too, and continuing as I coach now executives, this idea of, yes, I can get the results, but at what cost and what am I modeling to others? Right. And so what else do you see people struggling with? So this is, um, I love this question so much. And I talk about leaders think they seek results when in actuality, they are pursuit of peace of mind. And when leaders focus on the outcomes of the collective work they're doing, they will achieve peace of mind because I've seen leaders that are only focused on the results. They will high five when they get the results and at what cost. They have driven their teams into the ground with meetings and emails and people are worn out and they can claim victory in the moment. And then what happens the next month or next quarter when they don't get the results, we're on this roller coaster again. Those are not sustainable leaders, but the ones that have the courage to say, hold on, I may not have gotten the result this month, but let's look at our leading indicators of how many people are now improving their capability, how many people are cross-trained, how many people can now say they can actually talk directly with a customer when maybe they couldn't before. We need to be patient and have the courage to hold the corporation at bay because ultimately we want to not only get to the final outcome, peace of mind, not necessarily result. Because I'll tell you, a customer doesn't care if your quality is 99.9, where you have a 98% service level. They want to know that you have their back, you've built a trusting relationship, and you do work in partnership. That's the outcome from the long game. And when leaders don't see that, and they just focus on the results, they're going to be a distant memory. So that's where I think differently. And I talk about that in the book, elements of focusing on your purpose, and then on performance, those two compass points of purpose, and developing the people capability to higher performance, those two together often bring you to true north or peace of mind. I love that so much as, you know, as I see so many leaders that are high achievers are trying to meet their goals are very often thinking very short term to your point. It's like, get the results this quarter, the numbers, the fires, the, the drills, all the stuff, and they are missing the long game. And it's unfortunate. And then what happens in the process is that people become a casualty. The leaders lose their confidence and they may eventually leave the company. And so one has to, like I say, have the courage to say, here's the purpose and the vision. Here's the greater strategy. Here are the enablers and here's what we need to do. And if you don't have that courage or you're not in the environment that appreciates that, either one, you've got to help influence that and do things differently or you need to move to a different environment. And that's exactly what I did as well. So um, how has the pandemic impacted all of this? Has it intensified it? What have you, what have you seen? You know, I have an interesting view of the world. <laughs> I know people have been impacted. Their lives have changed, but I've seen a lot of resiliency. And while we, our work environment has changed, it's simply a symptom of the next crisis, the next thing that could change next time it's a supply chain issue. You can't get a particular item. It could be the loss of a leader change in ownership. Yes. People are more stressed than they had to accommodate to a new way of working, 
but people still called for my services because they still had to produce a product or service just in a different way. So people think there's a great resignation. People think people are rebelling against old ways of working. And I suggest to you that the problems have always been there. We've just not acknowledged them and accommodated the needs of the people to live fulfilling lives as well as having fulfilling careers. I have seen people hold off on certain initiatives because having enough resources to do the work, given the pandemic, having enough finances. Yes, short term people have been impacted, but the work is still there. In 2022, I see already signs of the work will accelerate because business owners still need to grow their business or go through transformational changes. It's just the way we work is different. And I think leaders need to be highly attuned to ways of working, team performance, which is a constant, despite the changes in the environment. Because at the end of the day, regardless of the crisis, the pandemic, change in leadership, you, people still run the companies and we have to focus on what we can control. And that's our capability and ability to respond to the changes. That's what's different. I love what you said that people have always wanted fulfilling careers and fulfilling lives. It's not just because it's been a pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, it, I think now we um, employees have a little bit more in that social contract, right? And we're at, they're asking for more. They're willing to say what they want potentially. Um, or they're, like you said, they're willing to leave and find it somewhere else or follow a leader that they love over here um, because that's the leader that they want to work for because that they are giving them that fulfilling career and life. Yeah. So the lesson for leaders, and again, you say you like asking well-placed questions for whoever is listening here, whether you're in the C-suite or aspiring, be that person that says, okay, we got through that crisis, but always be open to ask your team, what's next? What haven't we addressed? If something changed, do we have the right resources, the right talent within our team? Do we know how to be agile? Can we switch roles? Whatever those scenarios are, a smart and wise leader should be asking such questions from a risk perspective. Where are we still at risk should the environment change? And see what bubbles up from your people. That's a purpose-driven leader, not only saying, what are the opportunities? What should we do now to get ready? And what are the risks? That's what leaders should be asking right now uh, as they also develop themselves personally. It's a really great actionable question. And it's proactive. Yeah, I've always been about proactive. I mean, again, it comes from the deep rooted thing. I hate surprises. They, there is a book, you know, Who Moved My Cheese? And it talks about resiliency and responding to the changes. If the cheese move, what are the people? The people that cower in a corner and hope the change goes away to people that are agile. And you know what? I appreciate that book. But then I said, I want to be the person moving that cheese, not the one reacting to it. I hate surprises. And again, life has surprises. But then if there are surprises, how resourceful are you to be able to move very quickly and get in a position of control? Again, by virtue of my training, problem solving, quality, root cause analysis, not only should we be able to fix the problem, but ask the questions, how did we get into this place to begin with? Did we give our people the right tools? Did they have the right decision logic? They chose to do this instead of that. How can we prevent this in the future? And the more questions we as a leader ask, how can we prevent something? What capability do we need to build for the future? What are our current risks that maybe haven't bit us yet? <laughs> but if they did and all the planets lined up, what would that look for? And, and so many leaders try to throw the dice, gamble a little bit, say, oh, that's never going to happen to us. And then that's how that's the downfall of some leaders. So that's what leaders could be doing now is to having the courage to ask better questions. Oh, I love that. Oh my goodness. And um, as you coach leaders to ask better questions, to mitigate risk, are there better ways to do that? And do you teach that in the book in terms of preparation or is it just an ongoing mindset to have? It is a mindset. Um, there are some tips that I put in the book. I mean, in the book, I do start with simply personal development of a leader. You can't go and lead others if you still have things that you're dealing with. Do you have the courage to ask for help? Do you have a program to mentor your people? Do you know how to ask for feedback or give feedback? Because if you don't, you can't grow your people. So 
some of the questions that I think are very powerful, and I do this in my Powerful Words uh, webinar that I do, is just asking for feedback and giving leaders a framework to do that. And I'm sure in your coaching work, there are ways to ask for feedback. They're positive and actionable because I am finding leadership shies away from feedback because there's a profile of it being scary and not actionable. And so I do talk about, and these are things you can action on right away. When you ask for feedback, we should ask for feedback. What should I continue? Which is a strength. What should I possibly start doing, which enhances a strength? And then what should I change that if I don't change it, it might detract from a strength. We as leaders can ask that of our teams as the collective or for our own individual performance. And I think if we incorporate the question of what should we continue, what should we start doing, or what we should change, that question helps the team uh, get to a better place because it fosters dialogue. It absolutely does. And in my work with executives, I feel like this is a place where they are not in practice of seeking feedback. They are giving a ton of feedback. They're, they're, they're growing, they might be growing their teams and giving yeah. feedback because they feel like that's their persona as a leader. It's my job to give the feedback, to fix the stuff, to, they come to me. Um, but the really strong ones, um, the ones that are focused on, you know, self-awareness and continuing to grow, growth mindset, all those kinds of things, they're, those are the ones that are actually seeking feedback, but it's not as common as you'd think. So it's scary. And I will tell you in February of 2021, I sought the support of a coach and more around brand and image and impact, both the internal messages of what was coming out of my talkative mouth, as well as the exterior image to match what I was saying. And she interviewed about 10 people. She looked at my social media. She looked at my work and says, Deb, I still don't understand you. You're all over the place. And it was like, oh, I've been working so hard on getting my message out there. But when I paid her for feedback and got the feedback, I was taken aback. And in the moment, it doesn't feel good because you've been working so hard. High performers work hard to check the box and get certain things done. But then when you ask feedback on how are you showing up in the world or what is the impact of the work that you're doing and you get that feedback, what I do share is, okay, it doesn't feel comfortable process, leverage the introvert part of your, your skills, and then sleep on it and come out and say, you know what, you might be right. And then what could I do differently to align my message? So it's consistent and people understood or understand what the drop in CEO is about. It took courage. It didn't feel good, but I feel so grateful for the people that I partnered with that gave me the feedback so that I could eventually achieve a higher performance. So as I said, I'm a work in progress, but that is such a strength for leaders to be able to say, I need help. I need some coaching. I need some feedback. Oh, and I love that that's in your book is starting with self-development, right? Um, and what a, what a powerful thing to model for your team. Like, Hey, I don't have all the answers and I'm it's continually learning and I expect you to do the same. Thank you for that. There are many personal development books and there are many how to build an organization. There are many great books behind me. They are on my shelf of here are the things and the structures you need to put together a business. But what they don't do is combine the two. It's an either or. You need to do the work. So the first chapter, I even after I deliver it to the person reading it, I say, put the book down. Don't go to chapter two. I need you to stop and think about how has your leadership performed? Have you gotten the right results? And don't go on to the rest of the chapters because then they are how to's. How to take an existing business or an existing operation that you have been talented for. You don't need to blow it up and put something completely new, but you may need to make some course corrections. And it's the seven compass points or dimensions for which I've seen. If you move one, move the other, eventually you come back to north or peace of mind. So it's the how to, because I find you take these courses, you go out for training but they lack the mentoring and the practical approach of how to implement something. And I put a lot of that in there, how you can immediately apply some of these principles to get action or results in days, not months. Wonderful. Well, tell me more about um, how to connect with you and work with you. I know your, your website is dropinceo.com. What can we find there? 
dropinceo.com, D-R-O-P-I-N-C-E-O.com. That is my brand. That is the website. And when you arrive there, you get to learn a little bit about myself. You will also get uh, access to the book, The CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Get Back on Track. You get the Drop-In CEO podcast, where I've had the good fortune of interviewing amazing industry leaders to bring forth their insights and inspiration to you. And I write on a weekly basis. I've got my blog post. I share my best insights to help elevate your performance. So thank you to everybody for reaching out via my website. And if you do want to have a conversation, you can contact me as there as well. That's so great that it's all in one place. Well, I really appreciate getting to know you and our really great conversation today. Just thank you so much for the insight that you've given our audience. And thank you so much for your time, Deb. All right, Laura, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I want to thank you so much for listening to the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. If you are enjoying this content, please remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. By leaving a review, you are helping others find this content. We will be featuring five-star reviews on air in upcoming episodes. Editing and support for the podcast is done by S&E Podcast Management. To get more tips and tools to help you live a life guided by your values, go to thecatchgroup.com. Keep your boundaries and take care.